Hi. Um, so my name is Alison Gerber, and I work as a sociologist at Lund University in Sweden. Um, and today I'm going to talk a little bit about some research that culminated in a book that came out a little while ago, but mostly in order to tell you about my last and biggest sort of nagging doubt. Um, but I'm going to start by telling you a story about one artist that I met during this project. Her name's Venus de Mars. Um, so this is Venus and her wife Lynette in a photo by Wing Young Huey. So Venus is a musician and a visual artist that lives in Minneapolis, Minnesota in the US. And a couple of years back, she was in the middle of uh, a tax audit by the Minnesota Department of Revenue. So this is when the tax uh, organization comes after you and thinks you maybe lied. Uh, <clears throat> and I had heard a couple of things about this audit that kind of piqued my interest and I wanted to know more, so I called her. Um, and that first time we spoke on the phone, uh, she started to tell me her story. So at that point, Venus hadn't held a day job in more than 10 years. Um, she'd made about $30,000 from her artwork in the year before we spoke. And um, she had worked with an accountant for more than a decade to file something called a Schedule C. So this was this itemization of her profits and losses. Um, and it's what small business people in the US use to um, file their taxes. And with this Schedule C, um, self-employed uh, self workers uh, can write off their business expenses. So that means, um, everything from like tubes of paint to computers. Um, for a lot of people, for most small businesses and large businesses, these kinds of deductions uh, make doing business possible. But that year, that year we spoke, um, the Minnesota Department of Revenue had officially ruled Venus to be a hobbyist. So at the end of that first conversation, really late at night, um, I asked this intentionally stupid question. Uh, I asked her, well, isn't the worst possible outcome here just a change in the way you do your taxes? Like, maybe you have to pay them back a little bit of money? And her voice caught, and she said, it feels like it's discrediting me as a person and just throwing my 20-year career out the window, saying you were just playing the whole time. It can crush you. So I study how people understand the value of the things that they do, um, how they talk about the things that they do as worthwhile, as worth something, right? The analogies that we draw and the arguments that we make when we say, what I do is worth something. Um, and so the work I'm gonna talk about today is based on spending a lot of time with artists. I could tell you this really long method story. Uh, I think it's really interesting, but I kind of acknowledge it can be a little dull. So for now, I'll just say, um, I focused on artists in the United States. Within that, I have spent time with artists whose work is at the MoMA and the Guggenheim, as well as artists whose most important exhibition ever was at a church cafe in South Dakota. I've been to a lot of places and talked to a lot of people, um, and I also use archival data on artists' organizations in the US and Canada and Sweden, and artists' oral histories to make historical arguments. So for a moment, I'm going to focus on one thing from my data, and that's an account of value. Um, so I look at artists' narratives around investment and their expectations around returns. Um, and what I mean by that is uh, I'm talking about stories with a beginning and an end. So there would be a lot of stories within one uh, interview. And I consider artists to be talking about investments in their practice when they both refer in one narrative to finite resources, maybe money, time, and uh, presumed or hoped for or past very specific results or outcomes, right? Um, and I'm gonna call those uh, accounts of value. And I'm gonna really quickly outline a sort of typology of these accounts of value a typology of accounts that are really widespread in this community. And then I'll try to show why recognizing the kinds of claims that artists make about value and the relationships between different kinds of claims can help us understand different kinds of art worlds 
and to act within them. So the first type of accounts that's really widespread in my data is what I'll call a pecuniary account. These are like bread and butter, uh, bottom line accounts of value. When I say pecuniary, I'm talking about accounts like this one from Josh. Uh, he answers really quickly when I ask him whether he considers his finances when he begins a new project. He says, oh yeah, I always have. Even when I was borrowing money from the bank to make work, factoring in how I would pay it back, the math that would be required in order to pay it back, doing math like, okay, this photo is going to cost $25,000 to make. It'll be an addition of five, and each one will sell for 15000 which means that I'll make 7500 for each. Which means 7500 times five is the total income, less the investment of 25000 equals this. In my head, yes. These are confident stories. They're straightforward. They make sense to just about everyone. A second kind of account are the ones that I call credentialing accounts. So we see these when artists point to teaching or commercial work that they could do when they say they could always teach. Um, uh, and when they use skills gained through artistic practice to occupy sometimes very specific and strange positions in labor markets. So Peter, he's mainly a sculptor, but he works as an engineer. Uh, and he told me, I worked in the newspaper industry for two years as a pre-press technician, and that was, my art, art degree helped facilitate that. It was a good job, a real job. But now, he worked in this engineering firm, and he said, well, I do a lot of 3D drawings on the computer. That was just kind of how I was able to get the work. Uh, and he talked about his boss. The things he liked about me were just my inventiveness. He just liked me because I'd pretty much done everything. So in these two kinds of accounts, we see artists entering the world of market work and paid employment as artists in ways that both make sense to artists who have, like, for centuries uh, sold artworks, taught others, applied their skills outside the art world, and in this world of jobs where selling your product, skills, time by the hour or by the piece, these are normal ways to calculate worth and value. But there are other kinds of accounts too, right? A third type is the relational story. So Rosemary, Rosemary has a collaborator and together they run this very large project that costs them $26,000 a year. And she sums up the relational impulse really eloquently. She says, people used to say, well, you guys must be so rich to do this. And okay, I grew up poor, it's real money. But at the same time, other people who are like in the middle class or whatever spend that much on school tuition for their kid. And nobody thinks twice about it. So I really resist the idea that this is somehow abnormal. Like, I think it should be as normal as paying $26,000 a year for your, instead of having a kid, we have our community. So these kinds of accounts of investment, they sort of transcend clock time, um, the ideal space for these accounts is a public space, and the ideal artwork is one that sparks public debate. Uh, a fourth and final account, kind of account that's really widespread in the arts, it shouldn't be surprising to anyone with any, any experience in the arts or knowledge of art history, we'll call them here vocational accounts. So these are arguments that the things we do for love have real value. Uh, like when Armando tells me, when I ha say time for myself, I mean time for my work. Or when Peter makes us both laugh, when he tells me, oh, I'm just one of those people who's always working, which is really hard financially. So these four types, they're not mutually exclusive, they're not personal traits. Different practices are accounted for in different ways. And individuals can move sort of synchronically and temporally from account to account. And I began to notice patterns in the ways that artists used multiple kinds of account within a single, single narrative. And I, was one, I wanted to find out what those patterns might look like overall. Um, I thought that pecuniary and credentialing accounts, they would probably co-occur most frequently because they were sort of logically coherent. And I was like, I'll be able to collapse these two kinds of account into like one instrumentally rational category. It'll be great and parsimonious. Um, but when I sorted these bits of paper into piles, I was kind of surprised at what I found. So by, by, by far, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm a little jet lagged, sorry. Uh, so by far the largest part of pa pair of narratives, uh, which was literally a, like a pile sliding off my desk, was this group of stories that wove pecuniary and vocational accounts into each other. 
Um, and this despite, for example, that pecuniary accounts are really short-term and specific, while vocational accounts call on sort of transcendent, suspended notions of time. That these two types of account are used in concert so often might seem strange if you're uh, expecting to hear logically coherent accounts, but they're not strange to anybody who's spent any kind of time in art communities where this sort of push and pull of love and money is really central to arts practice and has been for a long time. So a big part of this project has been about understanding how and why artists use multiple accounts in concert. And I argue that marriages between diverse accounts, they don't represent sort of temporary or ad hoc or fragile agreements, that actually the particular kinds of marriages that we see are constitutive of particular fields. So in this case, the room around sort of love and money, doing it for money and doing it for love, is one that's made especially for a dance that we all, we all know the steps, but we maybe improvise our own flourishes. And the artists that I spoke to, they used pecuniary and vocational accounts together to position themselves and their practices and their works as both serious, which in today's art worlds usually means professional, means being an occupationally committed working artist, regardless of your training or income, and called as doing it both for love and for money. So people say that artists don't talk about money. Uh, that's not true. Uh, but what they mean when they say that, I think, they have a particular caricature in mind. And it's this image of the artist that we're talking about when we say that talking money in the arts is taboo. It's this sort of artist as spectator, an art only accounted for in pecuniary terms. An artist with a clear sense of the risks of art practice and a strategy for maximizing returns on investment. It's this image of the artist that we're talking about when we say that talking money is taboo. It's this person playing the game, right? Trying only to make a living. I'd argue that this sort of soulless artist as spectator, it's only one of the caricatures that sort of stands at the boundary of a world of art, art, prast, uh, art practice. Vocational accounts, they have their limits too, right? So imagine the artist who works only for love, not money. So they're always independently wealthy or kind of garret poor. In the art world, they represent a sort of unfair advantage either in patrimony or in a willingness to suffer. The Sunday painter, um, in this telling, often retired with a wink since she never worked. They represent how out of touch and out of step those who make art only for leisure, only for love, can be with the rest of the community. Too much emphasis on credentialing is really undeniably taboo. Uh, artists really delegitimize practices that they see as aiming towards commercial work or the tenure file. Uh, artists who make artwork only to keep up their credentials. And relational accounts are only recently have only recently become widespread um, and legitimated in the art field, and they're the least secure. The caricatures that the define the outer limit of relational accounts of value, the sort of drunken younger man who simply aims to legitimate hanging out at the bar, or the politically active young artist who fundamentally misunderstands the disadvantaged populations she uses in her practice, these are relatively new and less well known outside of, of the art field. But all these boogeymen, they kind of live in the, the minds of artists and they structure their narratives and their, their criticisms. I think that understanding how pecuniary frame, frameworks coexist alongside others, how love and money coexist, for example, it, it can help us to see why these caricatures are both meaningful and absent from the real world of art practice. Caricatures kind of define the unacceptable upper limit of each account of value. These are meaningful types of artists and even though no individual living artist actually fits one profile, these archetypes ma mark sort of the outer boundaries of the world of contemporary art practice. So in the book, I use the case of the arts to sort of sketch this model of the ways that social processes of disagreement about value work out. And I suggest that these processes sort of go through three stages, 
Um, first, traditional practices sort of undergo an occupational turn. Tensions between new and old orders of worth become to be expressed in conflicts over valuation. Then diverse accounts of value really proliferate. And then finally, some accounts, those that draw on contemporary visions of traditional practice, they achieve widespread resonance and become widely shared meanings through field-specific institutionalization mechanisms. And I hope it is clear by now that through this project, I became increasingly uncomfortable with the kinds of binary analyses that, uh, that are usually structuring our thinking around the art world. So if you're uh, a sociologist and you think about artists, you end up thinking a lot about Bourdieu. And this is not only because other sociologists force you to, it's also because the Bourdieuian map of cultural fields, this sort of two by two uh, figure with um, cultural and economic capital, is kind of the vernacular view of the art world as well. Um, and I'm assuming you know what I'm talking about, right? This view of the art world that splits it into a very simple dichotomy. It's a useful binary, right? Commercial art, art for art's sake. Uh, it kind of splits the art world into two teams and simplifies the world. Um, and several approaches, um, not just field theoretical, but also ecological and post-structuralist accounts, they center art objects and their movements in and across markets where binaristic visions of art worlds do offer quite a lot of leverage. Um, but I think when we move away from art objects and towards artistic and creative practices, the binaristic lens, it provides a blurry image with some really meaningful blind spots. I think if you start with art objects, in your analysis of art fields or art worlds, it's actually not surprising that you find this sort of competitive dichotomous field with all the position taking and power that we do find in the markets for objects. Um, but in my work, uh, especially with Clayton Childress, together, uh, our work together, we, we show that the vast majority of artists, they don't structure their lives around a winner-take-all market or an economic world reversed. They live in a sort of economic world obverse where both sides of the coin are visible at all times. And careers are made through really purposeful and agentic movement through multiple markets. An object-centered view where saleable artistic objects like a sculpture or a book ma manuscript, where those are the only legitimate outcomes and legible elements of creative practice, that view neglects the majority of activities that compose these practices. I think that using gravity as the force at play in a model can offer a, an intuitive way out of the stable oppositions of binarism and can help us capture the ways that individuals and their actions make sense in a really specific universe of meaning uh, without forcing them into fundamentally competitive and economistic relationships. So here, imagine ideal types as four bodies uh, orbiting one another, each one sort of laden with meaning and the relationships between them structuring a field of practice. So, we are egocentric and geocentric, uh, but it's useful to imagine these op bodies in orbit, not as planets revolving around some single sun, but as a group of suns orbiting one another, a type of constellation that we now know is common throughout the universe. So they vary in mass and age, and their trajectories are interconnected. So for some questions, there are really specific benefits to choosing gravity over polarity. First, it promotes an emphasis on both practice and cultural change in analyses of occupational communities. Patterned changes in the relationships between different ideal types make a new kind of sense. If you imagine them existing not in stable opposition to one another, but rather in slow varying orbits together, sometimes quite far from one another, and sometimes meeting and dancing together for a moment. They're in motion, and it's not random. It allows for an image of cultural change that's both meaningful and, for actors, relatively legible. <coughs> These people have read their art history. <laughs> their mentors made careers in a different age. They think they see their future and where their field is headed. 
artists and their activities in this model, they make sense through their relationships with these bodies in motion. Their legibility is relational and contingent and historically specific, like in the real world. A second benefit is that it, it acknowledges that artists generally need to manage overlapping but incommensurate forms of recognition, reputation, attention, and success. So a gravitational model can illuminate the issues that are represented by Bourdieu's y-axis, the sort of consecration success axis, in a really new way. And one that maybe better models a field of diverse actors aiming for distinct but related forms of recognition and reputation and attention and success. So here, artists and their activities, they can be seen to negotiate these four stars rep, uh, sort of gravitational pull, with the light reflected from each representing varying levels of success. Maybe different parts of the spectrum, the sort of varying lights thrown off by these stars, maybe that represents different types of consecration. The bright white of the visical, visible spectrum sort of bestows those with success in the market a kind of glow, whereas the heat of an infrared light, it warms those that are beloved by the most avant-garde critics. And rare artists can manage both worlds and sh sort of successfully throw off both light and heat, but only for a moment. So a third... Uh, way that I think this kind of model can help us think through artists and their activities uh, usefully. <laughs> so I'm not sure what I meant by that. Usefully. Uh, as sort of another benefit of, of abandoning sort of polarity for gravity, I think. If we continue with the sort of spectral metaphor, um, the sort of persistent hegemony of markets for objects in both vernacular and sociological understandings of artistic practice makes a new kind of sense, I think, if we imagine it not as deriving from willful economism, but from really simple issues of visibility and access. In this model universe, like in our own, only small sections of the spectrum are visible to particular actors. And those sections, seem to those actors to be the definition of light. So with some effort and some equipment, we can make the entire spectrum visible, but it might not actually change our subjective understanding and beliefs about the nature and reality of light. We can, for example, acknowledge the objective existence of infrared light without expanding our vernacular definition of light. Critical attention is nice, we might say, but the market defines real success in the arts. Artists that don't successfully navigate the space around these suns, artists that reflect no light at all, they might be more or less invisible to the field no matter what their activities without the light of sort of widely shared accounts to illuminate the things that they do. Um, and finally, I think this offers new ways to think around questions of visibility and legitimacy that are central to understanding boundary formation and boundary work in creative fields. So pure, uh, autonomous, or heteronymous pole artists, they're likely to be invisible to art worlds to the extent that they do exist. A model that uses gravity makes it really easy to understand how getting too close to a particular ideal type uh, how failing to manage the relationship between diverse types or becoming a caricature, how that can result in a sudden exit from the field, regardless of activity. Too much reliance on vocational accounts, for example, the artist sort of collides with the ideal type with all of its dangers and caricatures, sort of burns up too close to the sun and becomes just a Sunday painter. I think Thinking outside the art versus com commerce binarism helps us to understand things really differently. Um, and I think it can be especially useful in thinking around valuation beyond market value. So dualism is at the center of a lot of our social thought, right? And with it, we often imply zero-sum games and economic logics and competition. I think binaristically a lot of the time too, right? I have read and loved my Mary Doug Douglas, but not everything is locked into this sort of battle between love and money. And normatively, I'll say that I don't think everything should be. There's more to life than that, and there are other forces in the universe. 
So I've been working with all of this in part because in my work with artists, I've seen how the application of binary logics to the activities of everyday life often looks a lot more like the deployment of power and control than any kind of good faith attempt to understand, much less a prompt for positive change. Our beliefs about value, um, the stories we tell ourselves and one another, they have real concrete ramifications. Beliefs are enshrined in law, they are enshrined in institutions, and they structure the accounts that people are able and willing to give. So remember Venus, uh, the artist whose story I opened this talk with? So I've written a lot about her, and I think her story represents a re pretty remarkable crystallization of the effects of dualistic thinking about value in the arts. So the IRS, uh, the tax authority in the United States, and the State Departments of Revenue that use their guidelines, they say that in order to qualif qualify as a professional artist for tax purposes, you must show a profit motive. Um, but motives and, and intentions are really hard to prove, um, and artists have an especially hard time showing that the primary purpose of their activities is profit given that generations of artists have been taught to act as though they make art for love and not money. The truth that love and money are really deeply in interconnected in occupational artistic practice, that's something that artists can acknowledge in interaction, but it's much too complicated for public consumption. A distance from sort of filthy money is a normal part of the pose of the professional artist, and that's how a bad rule becomes really potentially devastating. So when the Minnesota Department of Revenue issued a final determination reclassifying Venus as a hobbyist, they sent her a really long document explaining why. One section read, the presence of personal motives in carrying on of an activity may indicate that the activity is not engaged in for profit. Underneath, there were bullet points that outlined the auditor's case against her. And in just a couple of words, the auditor sort of called into question the sort of centuries old understanding of uh, art as an expression of the artist's soul. He recast an aesthetic choice and a savvy brand building strategy as a black mark on Venus's record and relied on the myth of money as the antithesis of love to discredit her. The first point of evidence read very simply, the music and art are self-created by the taxpayer based on her life experience and perspective and are intensely personal. So I've seen these exact words cut and pasted into other audit documents. Apparently they function within the agency as a comprehensive dismissal of an artist's claim to professionalism, to serious intent, to profit motive. The art is self-created by the taxpayer and based on her life experience and perspective and are intensely personal. So sometimes the line between professional and amateur is a really bright and clear one. But in the United States, artists are for the most part just artists. They move in and out of day jobs and commercial work and employment and unemployment. Words like professional artist or serious artist, working artist, in the US and in most other places, these are really these are fighting words. And they mean so much in part because we don't agree on what exactly they mean. And I think we prefer not to agree. Um, when we accept these kinds of uncertainties, we are rewarded with a really rich and vibrant cult cultural life. There are no clear definitions and absent sort of the occasional obscenity trial or copyright trial. There's no authorities to enforce the boundaries. But then somehow, uh, the State Departments of Revenue, or the IRS, they end up becoming the only mechanisms we have to determine an artist's status with any finality. It's the auditor who decides, you're an artist, or maybe you're not. So in my work, I try to sort of understand and explain the ways that artists talk about the value of the way that they do, of the things that they do. And the patterns that I found sort of led me to this concern with processes of agreement and disagreement about value in working life and a theoretical interest in binarism and duality and social thought. But I wanted to close with a part of the story about Venus to bring the sort of technical conversation back down to the ground where I live. Um, 
because audits are a really useful crystallization of these conflicts between different kinds of value. And I think that Venus's story can show how deeply these debates can cut. Because when we talk about value, we're never really talking about money, right? We're talking about what we do and who we are and who we want to be. Thanks. <laughs>